If your license were gearing up for the end of 2022, I'd cover something a bit wide before diving back into the heavy content, especially since I've been looking forward to the end of the year video as it will close off a chapter for this channel. But as I keep you guessing for whatever that may be, let's talk about the blog. Getting flashbacks to the Munchables as, yeah, this was another game I rented during my adolescence from Hollywood Video. Rentals hit different back then, as you Zoomers can probably guess, as I was exposed to a cavalcade of games of varying quality back then, as all you had to go off of was the box art and any blurbs that caught your attention. On one hand, I got exposed to the likes of Kirby 64, Tales of Symphonia, and Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut. On the other, Zubos, Zoids, Battle Legends, and Yu-Gi-Oh! The Falsebound Kingdom. You want to talk about a crapshoot, renting could be like that sometimes, though it did kind of formulate my taste of video as I'm more than willing to gel with a game of more experimental or lower quality nature if there's at least something I can sink my teeth into. I mean, technically Zubos was my first exposure to the O's franchise, but that is a tale for another time. While I did make the joke of De Blob having a development team from outside the United States, as the footy reference was a hint towards Blue Tongue Entertainment's Australian origin, particularly towards the Australian Football League, or AFL, here's Minimi's video of the games of the sport to catch you up, De Blob originally started off as a Dutch production. A school production to be exact, handled by a group of students from the Utrecht School of the Arts and Utrecht University. Much akin to the previously covered White Chamber, there isn't a grand story to tell. If anything, this quote from the Beginning Games websites tells the whole story. De Blob was made by eight students of game design and development at the Utrecht School of the Arts and one student of computer science at Utrecht University, commissioned by the Information Center for the Utrecht Station Area. During the next 15 years, the station area will be completely renovated. Some roads will become canals, there will be a new station, a cinema, a casino, and so on. To inform everyone about what it will look like, we were commissioned to make a game that takes place in the new station area and brings it to life. Essentially, the game was a way to introduce how the new renovations would look for the area while also providing a bit of entertainment to those visiting as the original De Blob game was made for the general public. That said, freeware versions of the game were released in both Dutch, the game going by De Blob in this language, and English, the game going by The Blob in this language, speaking markets where the game got good press. The official Banana Games website has a few favorable reviews listed, though Link Rot is a bitch so I can't post the findings. What I can say is that this caught the attention of THQ, who snatched up the license. So while the team at Banana Games would rebrand as Ronimo Games and develop Awesome Knots, THQ handed its newest acquisition to the subsidiary developer Blue Tongue Entertainment. Shockingly, Blue Tongue is what I will call a somewhat household name. Besides developing Jurassic Park Operation Genesis, they handled the Nicktoons line of games, from Unite to Attack the Toybots. Like the publisher that had acquired them, Blue Tongue mostly stuck with licensed games, as they did churn out the Polar Express and Barnyard games to the dismay of everyone. Very mixed is what I would say, as this is someone who doesn't particularly like the Nicktoons games. I wonder how much heat this statement will get me. But Blue Tongue proved that they could put on a decent showing, and with THQ kinda lambasted as the license-based publisher, Having an ace in the form of De Blob caught many people's attentions, with the game chosen to be developed on the Wii. As I'm having to waffle a bit here, as there isn't much information on De Blob that has been put out into the ether, while most of the team on the game had worked previously on other Blue Tongue games, the art director for De Blob is a bit of an odd one. That being Terry Lane, whose earliest credit dates back to 1997's Carmageddon. The lead audio director John Gascott and composer Liam Price are also two oddities, as John handled the audio for Pac-Man World 3, a game whose development had Don Bluth involved as it changed from idea to the next, and Liam would go on to All Points Bulletin and Total Warhammer 3. That is a jump to say the least. 
While Deblob was originally released on the Wii September of 2008, basically worldwide, the game did see a multitude of re-releases, first on Windows, then the PlayStation 4 and X-Bone, all three taking place in 2017, then on the Switch in 2018. I will be looking at the Steam copy of the game as it is the version I own. The story, if you can call it that, is that one day while the citizens of Chroma City, the paint-based radians to be exact, were love and life, a terrible army of ink blots, the inked corporation led by Comrade Black, invaded and essentially steamrolled the defenseless swatches. Forced to become gradients and have their culture decimated and reshaped into 4x4 cubicles, the imprisoned radians had become corporate slaves, with the only revolution fighting back being a group of four. Artie, Biff, Zip, and the Professor. And even then, they were forced into a corner by the overwhelming forces of the Inked, until a living Jackson Pollock creature dubbed De Blob intervened. As the new spearhead of the color underground, De Blob, aided by the other revolutionaries, takes the fight to Comrade Black and his forces, freeing Chroma City from a boring world. All the cutscenes in the game lack any dialogue going off of Banjo-Kazooie or Monster Hunter language and are more visual based with tons of gags that paint the clear picture of what is going on. Most written dialogue is either mission briefings or the cast telling you what to do next. Again, this is the bare minimum of a story needed to facilitate gameplay, so there really isn't much to linger on here, though I did find the comedy stylings funny and the simple story charming. You like jazz? No, seriously, that is a question you must answer, otherwise I'm sending you to a detention cell for re-education. Above everything else, including the visuals of the game, which I will get to, music plays a heavy part within the Blob, as it serves as an audible gauge for how well you are doing. Is the backing track muted and quiet? Either the level just started, you've entered a new area, or you've taken damage. Is it loud and bombastic? You're doing well in putting the boots to the Inked Corporation. The music matches the tone of the action, as rolling through the grayscale streets doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Everything looks intimidating, or as much as it can in this cute art style, and you don't have a foothold. This is honestly encapsulated when you don't have any of the depots transformed as Inkies will continually spawn, making your attempts to free the Radians that much harder. Then, once you've either demolished the corpo buildings of the Inked Corporation or painted a good amount of the dull landscape, that's when you start getting the heavier musical swings. Softer hums become a full chorus, the jazz band ratchets up the horns, all that. <laughs> jazz. And this isn't even getting into how each track is different, setting the mood for the blob, or how each color handles a musical section. While variations and styles of jazz are the main soundtrack, there are interruptions of funk, reggae, gospel, salsa, and other types of what I will dub feel-good music. It captures the sense of fighting a revolution not with armed revolt, but with peace, love, and all that.
Each track has at least six renditions, from low, medium, and high moods to the submerged ink version of the theme which sounds muffled as if the ink is drowning out the joy. Onto the colors themselves, they all play a range of instruments when you paint for your selected mood. Take Blissful as the example. Red is coded to hums, green keyboards, purple guitars, orange horns, yellow flutes, and blue bass. The odd one out of the colors is brown, as no matter the track, it will always play turntables, but what the other colors play is mood dependent. The best way I can showcase this is to just let the game showcase it for me. Again, there are about 12 mood tracks in the game, each with sub variants and accompanying instruments that add to the musical potluck. Switching over to the visual front, De Blob does one of my favorite things. It provides you a time lapse of your stay in a level. The mere act of moving De Blob leaves a paint trail that lasts forever, seeing your exact path you took in a stage. The buildings themselves are a more advanced version of this, as you can tell when you're finished with an area when it is all bright and cheery, with radians frolicking about without a care in the world. You, up close and personal, get to see how an area goes from a gray slurry of business and commerce to a rainbow of artistry and musical celebration. Carrying this spear is that there's such a massive difference between ink and radian culture. Inkies favor more boxy and plain architecture, such as their tank depots or watchtowers. Sure, there is an odd periscopic lens poking out of the towers, but the building is mostly a simple cube. Contrast that with the lively radiant structures that contain reverence for nature, art, or music. The Ministry of Ink goes from an imposing governmental structure to a literal soundboard, complete with scratch records. To add one final layer on this, 
the inked forces aren't absent from this overarching design philosophy. Many of their tools and weapons are in the shape of that classic ink fountain pen design. The turrets of the tanks and hulls of the speeder bikes are just an ink pen. On the flip side, the Color Underground has a bristle paintbrush as their logo, a sort of comparison between the rigidity of the inkies and the free-flowing nature of the radians. Ink is more definitive, it is hard to wash off, and typically stains whatever it touches. It blots out other colors. Paint is more collaborative. It mixes with other colors to form new ones. We have a whole subset of paint called watercolors, expressing that it is malleable with the elements. In tune with them, you could say, as if to say that the Radians are a peace and nature-loving bunch compared to the strict and militaristic Inked Corporation. There is quite a bit of thought put into the dynamics of the two races that is a joy to look at. Animation-wise, while the Blob is mostly a rolling sphere, he has fun squash and stretch that would make a cartoonist proud. He smooshes when he presses himself up against a wall, shifts and contorts when he bounces on enemies, and generally flows and shapes himself based on what he's doing like a fluid. Oh, and he has personal little animations connected to certain situations like completing challenges or fighting enemies. The Blob is surprisingly expressive despite being a ball of living paint. Voice-wise, as mentioned earlier, this is the heartland of Banjo Country. A uh, different banjo. Characters all have their own grunts and dialects, and while some words are basically English and Radian, most of everyone just babbles at you in their incomprehensible language. This just adds to the adorable factor of this game, so this isn't a complaint. I want my funny cartoon characters to speak a funny cartoon language, and by god, they do here. The Blob is a 3D platformer collectathon focused on coloring the environment as the main gameplay goal. On the difficulty side of things, there isn't a selection and the game is easy to a supreme degree. Like, I have vivid memories of the Blob giving me trouble when I was a youngin only because of the Wii version, the only version at the time, having awkward motion controls. Strip those away and most of the unintentional bite this game had is missing as the Blob isn't aiming to challenge you. It is a carefree game in tone, and that carries over to the gameplay. Because of this, while there are enemies and hazards, they're more living obstacles than anything else. There are other modes of play than the main single-player experience, but I only stuck with it as that is what I remember, and the free paint and blob party modes are either the main game with no threats or a multiplayer option. To begin, level progression in the blob is fairly standard. You beat a stage to unlock the next one, also unlocking different challenge tracks for a level, but what you do in a stage is where I will dive in deeper, mostly because of the game's mechanics. Starting off a level has you pick the blob's mood, with more moods unlocked after you beat levels. This determines what music tracks will play as you paint as well as what additions the colors you paint with add to the backing track. What mood you pick has no effect on level rankings and is purely up to preference. Do you want jazz, funk, etc. to play as you go through a course is the question you'll be asking yourself. Starting off a stage proper, the blob will always start with 10 paint points to his name, no color, and generally zero color energy, or in other terms, level points. For a breakdown, paint points are your health. Kinda. To do most of what the Blob needs to do in a level to complete it, he needs an abundance of paint points, but taking damage from ink or spike sources also saps him of paint points by different means. Ink drains paint points until the Blob dies or washes off the ink with water, while spikes puncture the Blob for a set number of points. Water also drains the Blob of paint points and removes whatever color he is, but won't kill him. Only by being at zero paint points and taking damage will kill the Blob and take a life away from him, but that is so rare that you are mostly not in danger. Time is more strict than taking damage, as each level is on the clock, but more on that later. Acquiring paint and paint points is as easy as slamming onto a paint bot, which comes in three color types and two variants. Red, blue, yellow, and 10 and 30 points. You can hold a maximum of 100 paint points, but good luck holding onto that many as stated above with what uses paint points. And going off of the standard color wheel, mixing the primary colors gives you the secondaries of purple, orange, and green, plus the composite brown if you mix orange with blue, purple with yellow, or green. Red. 
red. As long as you have a color in paint points, touching a building will paint it in that color, draining away one paint point, and if it was originally grayscale, award 100 color energy, i.e. level points, with a multiplier added if you color multiple buildings in a single stretch, like in the case of wall sliding two or three buildings in one go. However, if you touch an already colored building with a different one, it will change to the new one, still sapping you of one paint point and only awarding 10 color energy points with the same multiplier stipulation. Now you know why paint points are hard to hang on to. Continuing with buildings, painting a group of them awards additional points such as group, block, or avenue points, plus freeing any gradients trapped inside for 50 points a radian and additional time for a completely freed group. To maximize pointage outside of challenges, you must color in full blocks to get the group bonus, but you must do so with different colors. A one color group scores less than a seven colors group. This is where time comes into play. To get these massive color energy values, you need time which is always ticking. The blob doesn't move all that fast, and while he can jump, it isn't very high and he has the tendency to stick to walls eating into his level clock. That's why completing challenges and freeing radiance awards 60 and 30 seconds respectively, giving you more time to finish your works of art. Challenges themselves also award points for completion, though they award more if you can beat them in one go. There are four typings to deal with. Race, Paint, Combat, and Monuments. The first three are self-explanatory, though with paint you might have to juggle colors to paint specific buildings, specific colors, with monuments essentially changing the status of the level like enemy spawns or environmental hazards. While you want to do them all to get both time and color energy points to maximize level ranking, monuments add an extra benefit of making level traversal easier. Monuments themselves need to be colored in a specific color with a weird hatch on the building telling you the amount of paint points of what color you need. You then lock on and pump away. Challenges can range from optional or not, but accomplishing their tasks usually unlocks more to do. Why you want to earn color energy points is that levels are gated off into sections. By reaching certain point values, you unlock gates, which award massive time bonuses, or open up transform engines that are either mandatory for level progression, completion, or both. You know you've finished a level when the exit gate is opened and you've been awarded the bronze medal, but to get silver or gold, you must do a bit of optional work. Likewise, level progression is viewable from the pause menu, offering you a detailed report on what you need to do to fully complete a stage. This generally includes painting a set percentage of the level, freeing all the radians, and so forth and so on. Because of this, levels are hub-like in nature, as you can always jump back to any section in case you miss something. Combat, while rare into blob, is handled via locking onto your target and smashing them. That is how all enemies are handled, but wherein lies the difference is attack types and paint point values. Enemies are divided into ranged and melee groups, with the biggest factor separating them being their health. Standard inkies and elites only bum rush you, taking one or four paint points to pop, and a bit of color swapping for elites, while heavier ordnance like turrets or tanks take 50 to 100 points to squash. To ease this, even if you don't have all the points, you can still take a swing at these vehicles to damage them with the amount of paint points you have. Monuments work in this same regard as well. Getting hit by any enemy, outside of the leech bots, or falling into ink coats to blob in ink, meaning if he touches any colored buildings, he drains them back to grayscale. This doesn't come up all that often. There are also in the hazards department shock and flame floors, hitting for lives and time, but it just knocks those items out of your inventory, so you have to pick them back up. Like, neither are an issue as their related pickup is easy to find. Dying, as said previously, takes away one life from the blob, which he will have more than five at any given point, and that is if you avoid picking up free-floating lives, and restarts him back at a gate but doesn't remove his progression. The one time I did die was by accident, so as long as your brain isn't in powerful sponge with sour nerves, you should be okay. There are also color energy pickups that award level points. Stages sometimes come with gimmicks like boats, bounce pads, or conveyor belts that can be affected by buttons or merely something you have to deal with. 
They're not too in your face like the hazards. That's why I saved them for last. If I may indulge in some Zoomer language, de blob isn't outright mood. I think I've said the word before, but carefree is the overall tone the game is going for. I would put it in the same category as Animal Crossing as games fully focused on relaxing the player. The threats are minimal, and most of what will give you trouble is just figuring out which color you want to roll with. Do I want to jam out with bombastic funk as I take it to the man or slide into some salsa as I literally paint the town red? There is always a new song to unlock, providing you a different tone for each stage, making replayability an interesting little wrinkle in the game's hat. I chose to storm the Ministry of Ink backed by the sound of Revolutionary, a heady mix of horns and percussion that makes me think of island music, but I could have chosen any track of my choosing, giving a varied outlook on a level. There was nothing stopping me from using Funky, Brazen, or any one of the other mood tracks. Again, it helps that gameplay and presentation are integrated in the way that they are. You only get the louder versions of the mood tracks by completing objectives or restoring Chroma City to its former beauty, motivating you to do well so you can bump to whatever mood you picked. Inversely, getting inked, there's a casting couch joke around here somewhere, not only stifles your mood track, but reverts it back to its quietest form. It alerts you to the fact that you are in danger as you are no longer blaring out the dulcet tones of the revolution. I was more annoyed by taking damage than actually scared of dying as it meant whatever bop I was jamming out to got disturbed, motivating me to get it back up and running again. It's a lot like Devil May Cry 5 in that way as how loud the music is playing is the shorthand for how well you are doing. I think more games need to use this concept as it has untapped potential. On the levels, while none really grab out at me besides the fun part, the humor is what carries these stages with the enjoyable gameplay. First off, all the stages open up with a funny little cutscene depicting gradient suffering or inky tyranny. The whole office cutscene being a play on drugs does well to highlight some of the edgier comedy of the game, as color to the turned radians might as well be said in a boring world. I mean, gradient suffering is harvested for ink and in what amounts to painful needle extraction, but it's so funny how cruelly incompetent the inkies are. Comrade Black flash fries some of his men for failing to take back a part of Chroma City, and when he sees that one minion avoided the fiery fate, orders him to jump in. Cartoonishly evil in a fun way. The testing of the elite Inkies has shades of this as well, as the Inky in question acts all high and mighty when dealing with all the other colors, but when it comes to red, he gets splattered like a bug. All over the inked scientists as well. That's his blood they're coated in, but they don't bat an eye, just like the soulless cogs in the machine that they are. This brings me over to level conversion, as a lot of the radiant architecture terraformed into inked corporation structures makes a lot of sense. Propaganda towers are changed radio stations, the final prison in Gugatraz is basically an arts and crafts store, and the Church of Inktology is in all actuality a skateboarding factory a la the Fantasy Factory. These are all parallels to each other in some way, shape, or form, highlighting how truly opposite the Radians and Inkies are. One is so corporate-minded that their form of fun is the news, while the other so spirited that one of the most important locations is a fun park. A park that changes into an industrial one as a play on words. I think the fun park has the most visual humor when it comes to the corporating force of the Inkies. A spinner ride gets corrupted into a centrifuge that harvests the sadness of the Gradians as opposed to giving the Radians joy. There was a lot of thought and effort put into this world in capturing the identities of both major groups, adding a nice background to a somewhat relaxing experience, trying to optimize your painting skills. Don't 100% this game, you'll be pulling all the hairs off your head and wish for a miserable death. While De Blob tracks in-game objectives quite well, giving pop-ups for literally every percentile, amount of level painted, styles collected, radians rescued, etc., Tracking everything in the game by ear is a heartache in of itself. To 100% a level, you have to complete all the challenges, find all the styles, rescue all the radians, score enough points for the gold medal, paint the blimp, 
paint at least 75% of the level, paint all the trees, transform all the landmarks, use all transform engines, convert all the billboards, and do so under par time. That is a nightmare in of itself, mostly because there are a lot of granular details you have to look under a microscope. This is the cardinal sin of 3D platformers. Too much stuff. And this is mostly because you'll be surprised what counts as paintable objects. Moving cars count as them as do cliff sides and other miscellaneous material, which leads to a lot of doubling back in the case of missing surfaces. Not all buildings release gradients either. You can paint a full block or avenue and get no captives. Doubling down on the paint everything mentality that can be tiresome as not only are the levels in the block big, they're segmented off so missing a collectible can lead to a wild goose chase. This is the only time that the limit is a factor, as shooting just for level completion means you'll have at least 40 minutes banked before Inked tracks down the blob. Guggentraw's Island and the Fun Park are the worst in this regard. Being what feels like the largest level, the styles for Guggentraws are a pain to find as searching for them involves a lot of platforming and basically invading every little nook and cranny for them. While you can't permanently miss collectibles within the blob as long as you don't exit a stage, Finding what's missing is a snipe hunt at times. The fun park, meanwhile, has a lot of odd surfaces to paint that have the potential to release gradients. The cells are the main culprit of this, as it doesn't seem like they're buildings, but they are, in fact, and only some of them house gradients. All it takes is missing one cell in a group to make you wonder where the gradients are hiding, as you need to fully paint a group to free them. By far the worst part about the blob is both the camera and the controls. On the level, the controls aren't the worst when just normally playing. The blob does control a bit loose, but it is kind of fitting. Then you touch a wall while jumping. There are a few things that can happen. One, you slide off normally. Two, you get stuck and just sit at where the blob is positioned. Three, you attempt to jump off, leading to two subdivisions. You either carry momentum and fly off the wall like a bullet, or your jump is so unimpressive that you might as well just slid off if the game allowed you. Walls are the most finicky thing in the blob, as you can never grasp on how they'll treat you. Sometimes you can slide down for point multipliers. Other times, the blob freaks out and doesn't know what to do. You have to deal with this constantly, as climbing up any building means you'll be dealing with walls, adding another level of frustration. The too short dilemma. The blob can pull himself up when he's on the cusp of a ledge, but when he wants to do so is calculated by a cruel and angry god that thinks ledge mechanics are optional in a platformer. While having a drought of paint points means you probably won't be breaking the record on the high jump, having 50 or above still doesn't assure you that you'll be able to clamber up onto a row of buildings. Sometimes. There's no consistency as you can either make the jump just fine, get stuck on a wall but manage to roll yourself up, or just flat out get stuck requiring you to try again. There's a reason why De Blob's wall writing mechanic is used so sparingly as the game's physics love playing the lottery at your expense. That's why wall jumping has been relegated to a neat idea instead of a gameplay important move as momentum is so jittery and can be busted at times. You can scale up the higher places, but only if the blob has earned the god's favor by smiting enough of its enemies. Speaking of, some of the challenges can be a pain, mostly the painting ones that act more like puzzles the later you get on in the game. There came a point where if I could get away with not doing them, I would as I don't want to fumble around realizing that I need to be purple, then work my way down as red and blue to paint a set of buildings. I just want to paint, damn it. Lastly, the camera can be a pain at times as it likes to get stuck on the environment. Classical bad camera issues at play, and your only means of recentering it is by first person view, which is disorienting and really doesn't work. It is also pivotal in targeting enemies, which is akin to throwing darts at a dartboard. The Blob loves to lock onto monuments if there are enemies around or enemies when he needs paint. Combat is a cluster, which is thankfully why it is so simple. While I can solidly recommend the blob, I'll add two caveats. One, don't go for 100% completion. While the game is an easy pick up and play, maxing out all the levels is beyond tedious, requiring such microscopic attention that you are better off painting your own masterpiece in real life. Two, don't shotgun this game. 
The simplistic nature of the blob really wears thin in extended play. There isn't much variety in objects or enemies, so the basic loop can be tiring around the four hour or longer mark with the general foibles of the gameplay only adding to that. Again, this isn't me saying the game's bad. The general loop is fun in short spurts, plus the music and vibes of the blob aid and alleviate the potential tedium of a longer play session. Charm is a massive selling point here. That said, it is available on Steam for all those who want to give the OG Splatoon a whirl. Yeah, I found that out the hard way with a 7 hour recording session. You really see how threadbare the gameplay can be as my attention was zapped at the 4 hour mark. That's why I didn't throw that in bad as I mostly brought that upon myself. It is an issue of recording layering on top of the gameplay which isn't a problem most people deal with. In fact, I can say that about all the longer recording sessions I do as that is why I broke up the darkness into two. My brain just started zoning out, which isn't exactly great for analysis, both for games I like and despise. I can't talk about nothing as there is a literal void. Anywho, this show is made possible with the likes of the moviegoers within the peanut gallery and inner circle. Consider buying a ticket at patreon.com forward slash let's talk about games, no apostrophe in the let's, for behind the scenes access to LTA scripts, thumbnails, and other bonus material, your name in the credits, and early screenings of episodes, plus the Showtime reels. November saw me ramble on about the differences between Postal and Hatred as the dude shot through Paradise and Postal Redux, while December will be a host to a monster mash in the form of Destroy All Monsters Melee. Oh boy, Christmas and Godzilla, it's a miracle! And as always, this showing of the Blob is over, but stay tuned to our final feature of the year involving a switch from publisher to developer, newly added cover-based mechanics, and a dime store angel of death.